does, I'm going to going to start going. And it looks like the recording light is on. It's 11 o'clock, and let's go. It looks like there's um, a number of you here. Um, if for some reason, I like Rod mentioned, he has to check in and out. Under the file share, you will see that there is. I put the PowerPoint up here. I also put a Word document that has some articles that I reference. So if for some reason you just got to go, you can take the PowerPoint and go. But kind of the whole point of this um, is that that PowerPoint alone is only kind of half of what we're doing here. So the other half is what I'm about to say and what I'm about to do. And so if you just have that, you're going to miss some of it. But keep in mind you do have that. We're also recording this, so you can always watch this later. Now, I have a bad habit of talking way too fast, so by all means, if I start kind of my motor mouth gets going, don't hesitate to tell me to slow down. So I'm going to try to um, freeze this image, and let's see if I remember how to do it. All right, so uh, did I get it there? All right, because it's something like I get distracted when I look at myself. So. Um, so the focus of this is kind of using PowerPoint um, differently online. I've started getting into PowerPoint, um, gosh, I mean, I guess getting into it's not the correct word. I started um, having issues with PowerPoint um, five, six, seven years ago. All right, so do I, so this is something for Brian, you guys. Um, I think if you guys each move the slides, they're going to move. Um, so now it's not letting me go back. So let's stop sharing. You know what's funny is I actually um, copied this from another PowerPoint, so it wouldn't surprise me if I have timings in from a Pachakacha that I never even noticed. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to just share my screen, and we're going to go from there. Brian told me hey, this isn't the best way to go, so if this totally crashes, then um, I'm to blame, and Brian warned me. So, um, problem with this, I'm going to move a couple things around. Give me one second, and I'm going to just try to get everything lined up, because I'm going to try this one way, and we'll see how it works, and I want to be able to see the chat pod. All right, so let me know if... Um, What's interesting is I just showed the wrong PowerPoint. Hopefully you can all see this. Can I give a thumbs up or something that you can see using PowerPoint differently online? Hopefully you can. All right, so Genesis says yes, so I'm going to get going. All right, so um, and hopefully the sliding um, timings aren't in there the way I thought. But so this is what we're really going to talk about today is, is this kind of the death by PowerPoint movement and then we're going to get into what are you know what are some ways that we can improve our PowerPoint use or specifically strategies in face-to-face -face environments. Then we're going to talk about kind of the thesis, the main point that I'm trying to make, and that's that everything changes online. Um, everything might be a, um, a bit drastic, but that the way that we approach PowerPoint needs to change, um, specifically when we're teaching online. Then we're going to get into some of the tools and trades. Well, you know, if things change. Well, what, how do we use PowerPoint differently? What do we use? The last thing we're going to get into is kind of the distribution. That is, basically, you know, once I have my PowerPoint and I'm doing it differently, how do I get it online? Is it as simple as just uploading a PPT? Or are there other considerations? So we're going to talk about that. And then we're going to do some Q&A. Now, I realize that something like this, this is an organic group, so if you know, while I have this nice little neat agenda, um, I'm completely comfortable if we need to go off script. And um, so, by all means, throughout, jump in the chat pod. I'm going to be asking you questions in the chat pod a couple times, and we're going to go hopefully edit a Google Doc together. So we'll see how that works. Um, but by all means, at any point, I can stop, and we can go in a different direction. All right. So death by PowerPoint. So in the chat pod, what I want is if you can each write in the chat pod, what do you think of when you hear death by PowerPoint? I'm going to give a minute for you guys to kind of jump in there and tell me what you think of. The shootings of Educause, all right, that's great. Bullet points. 
What else? Now, some of you, like Rod, might not actually have gotten the question. And bullet points, too much information on the slide. These are, these are all some really key things. Um, and I'm going to tell you, all right, we'll start moving. Um, one of the things that I think of is I think of this guy, Peter Norvig. He, um, I believe he was working for Google, and he might still be working for Google. Um, but Peter did this little spoof um, about the Gettysburg Address. And, and basically, what Peter Norvig asked was, you know, if Abraham Lincoln was to use PowerPoint, what would, um, for the Gettysburg Address, what would it look like? And so he did this little spoof that's really great. And if you've never seen it before, just Google Peter Norvig or, or click on the, type in the, Norvig.com slash Gettysburg and you can check it out. But I think he, his point is a great one. And Norvig was really one of the first ones to say, hey, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. But the Death by PowerPoint movement, if you can call it that, if you can think of it as a movement, really started with this guy, Edward Tufte. Um, I tried to get a little bio on him from his website. Um, Edward Tufte has written seven books, including blah, blah, blah. Um, he writes and designs on analytical design. Uh, Professor Murtis at Yale. You know, he's written some great books, and I think Edward Tufte's brilliant. But the, the book that, um, that really got me into Edward Tufte, and I don't know if I can call it a book, but it's this thing called The Cognitive Style of PowerPoint. And it's not really a book, it's about 30 pages long, so it's probably more of like a monograph. Um, and I really, I recommend it for anyone to really read this. Um, this is the second edition, it looks like it's 2006. I think the first edition was 2004. You know, so this kind of got the this death by PowerPoint movement going. Um, and I think that his, you know, his title, this idea of a cognitive style of PowerPoint. So this way of thinking um, and how PowerPoints influence their thinking is is a really important idea. And there's actually I just read an article the other day. It was actually a year old, but it's how Google's making us stupid. And I think that that article I should probably find the URL and share it. But that article I think has a similar point of. How do our how does technology change the way we think? How the way that we read and write and and you can see in this article about does Google make us stupid? This argument that you know from the printing press on, when our technology changes, it changes the way we think and read and are and and so I think that's kind of this subtle point that Tufty's trying to make. But in these thirty pages, Tufty goes off and so on PowerPoint and I really recommend you read it if you don't have time or the money for I think it's a seven dollar. Um, is the price of it. I, a colleague and I wrote a book review on it, so that's freely available on the web. So I should probably post that at some point. Um, but right now, with my two strict screens going, I'm going to avoid getting out of this. Um, but while Tufty became the face of the death by PowerPoint movement, he wasn't the only one writing and ranting about PowerPoint or the problems of PowerPoint. The following are a few of some of the articles, titles, that people have written about the problems with PowerPoint going to give you a minute just to read a few of these. I think they're um, pretty amusing. So for some reason you have this desire that you really want to read, um, does PowerPoint make us stupid? If you look over in the file share um, pod over here, number uh, four, you will see that the PowerPoint articles, I tried to put a URL to each of these. Now these are just kind of a drop in the bucket. There are a ton of these out here. But I think that um, sometimes they're they're very important to kind of have a stop and think about the problems with the tools that we use. The tools that we use sometimes day to day. Now there's also some articles out there, and I should have been fair and balanced. And um, ooh, isn't that from some new show? Um, that I probably should have shared those too. But there are some articles out there that kind of take the other approach um, and argue against these. But um, but for now, we're going to focus on these. So I started getting into PowerPoint and ranting about PowerPoint a couple years ago. I blamed Joni in part to it. Um, and even before that, I, it, you know, my previous life in um, studying religion and focusing on storytelling kind of really questioned how PowerPoint kind of takes away the story that we tell. But I, after doing this for a couple years, I came across this guy, Don McMillan. He does this little comedy bit that I think is hilarious. And so the YouTube URL is there. If you've not seen this, by now, you know, this this version says there's only 54,000 views. I think there's a lot more people have seen this. This has kind of hit the, um, the web. But if you've not seen this, definitely take a look. I'm not going to show you this one. 
But I am going to ask you to look at this next one. Because this next one um, that I'm getting ready to pull up, I just saw the other day, and um, it's actually called Death by PowerPoint. So when we think about the Death by PowerPoint movement, I think it's um, a great one. So I'm going to actually take a minute and post the URL in the chat pod so that you can actually take two minutes to watch this. Rather than kind of bring it up myself and eat up the bandwidth through Connect, I'm going to give you two minutes to watch it. But I'm going to first post the URL in. Alright, so let's take this. Let's see how I navigate in and out of this. Alright, so there's the URL. I'm going to play it myself just so I can kind of have the time down. All right, so hopefully you all got a chance to look at that, and let's pull, let's get back to where we are, and hopefully, let me minimize, and by all means, feel free to chat um, and talk about whatever during this. So, um, and so I just step by PowerPoint video, I just thought was great, and so in ways, these two, this comedian and then this video, reminds me that kind of my old way of just ranting about PowerPoint with the PowerPoint is kind of passe, and I need to really um, step up my game because these people are doing some great stuff. Um, but Edward Tufte, kind of the face of his death by PowerPoint movement, really focused on six things that he had problems with. And these are, you know, kind of, you mentioned all these th um, already, I think. But it's this idea that um, low resolution is a problem with PowerPoint. You can't fit much on the screen. The bullet outlines that we tend to obsessively use and use nested bullets dilute thought, they fragment narrative. You know, he's critical that PowerPoint is deeply hierarchical and linear. He thinks that it fragments narrative and data, specifically data he hates, um, the little PowerPoint charts that people use. He thinks it encourages a preoccupation with format, not content. And finally, decoration of fluff, whether it's clip art, whether it's flying in transitions, he hates it all. All right. So what's, a, what's some problems with Tufty? Um, well, one, Tufty focused on presentations. He focused on content, statistics, not on learning and instruction. And so I think that's something that we have to think about, that Things change when we're actually thinking about how we use this as a teaching tool. Tufty, he also blames the tool. Um, he seems to think that somehow we lost our ability and that somehow that there's a bad person, not a bad person, but that there's a person behind every bad PowerPoint. It's not that the PowerPoint just kind of takes us over. Um, Tufty also has an overemphasis on content, which is going to be interesting because that's going to be a point I make or late, later on. Um, but he seems to think that you just need to get, you know, everyone just needs to buy his book with lots of good content and everything will be all right. Um, and that he doesn't really offer any direct strategies to improve PowerPoint. Tufty's kind of 
um, suggestion is basically just stop using PowerPoint. And, you know, that, that, that might work for him, but for others, some of us, it's, um, the question is not stop using, but how can we improve the way that we use PowerPoint? So while Tufty didn't really give any explicit um, tips rather than um, it's making us stupid and let's stop using it, he did kind of have some implicit recommendations. One is to use more visuals or to give handouts. Um, and handouts for him are not specifically PowerPoint slides, but rather specific handouts. He also um, indirectly suggests that we need to avoid using bulleted outlines. He also um, is critical of developing linear presentations and really kind of recommends focusing in um, non-linearly. And last is that to really avoid kind of distracting images and backgrounds. And so while I started getting into Tufty, um, you know, I started thinking about what are some of my own kind of things, um, you know, my own rules of thumb. I don't want to say rules that even probably is something, um, I don't like that word, but the ideas that I came up were 10 points, um, pun intended, that one, PowerPoint should support the learning objectives. That is, it should be tied to what you want students to learn and be able to do. Two, I think it's best to avoid using PowerPoint templates. As you can see, this is just plain background, so I try to keep it simplistic. Avoid using more than one level of bullets. So, you know, for a long time I argued that you shouldn't have these nested bullets because, you know, it kind of just confuses people even more. Um, less is better, and so I I'll be talking a minute about Pichakacha, but I think that there's a whole other movement of this kind of fewer slides is the way to go. Avoid distracting clip art or unrelated images. So images are great, but they need to be related in some way. Avoid distracting slides transitions. You know, the flying text in, the barn door. Um, try to use um, different strategies to improve the design. This one, CARP, is the idea of focusing on contrast, alignment, repetition, and proximity. Also try to avoid using caps. Now sometimes in titles and other times they can have a real aesthetic purpose, but a lot of but you know research has shown that reading all caps is harder to read. So if you're you have text heavy PowerPoints, you might want to avoid using caps. My other point was that we really PowerPoint's multimedia um, kind of platform. So we really need to leverage the multimedia and try to move away from text as you're seeing a lot of text right now, which I love. Um, the other thing is don't let PowerPoint control your teaching. So those were kind of my rule of 10, if you will, I came up with a couple years ago. But I think since that there's been some other interesting strategies that have come up. Um, this first one, this six by six, is this idea of use no more than six, li six lines per slide and no more, no more than six words per line. And so I, one, two, three, I'm seeing if I even violated that with number five. Um, this um, second one is the 10, 20, 30 rule. And I think that this was, um, a really interesting rule that Guy Kozowski came up with almost, I think, before even the Pachakacha movement. But his point was that a PowerPoint presentation should have no more than 10 slides, no more than 20 minutes, and use no more than a font smaller than size 30. And so I think that that's an interesting approach. And these next two, Ignite and Pachakacha, are kind of uh, two different ways of structuring presentations. The first one is with Ignite, it's 20 slides, time for 15 seconds each for five minutes. And the other one, Pichakacha's 20 slides for 20 seconds. And that's a six minute 40 presentation. And, and what's implied with both of these, Ignite and Pichakacha's, this idea that they're, um, that they're not text driven, but that they're image driven. And the Gar Reynolds has kind of 10 tips. And some of them were similar to these previous points. And some were similar to the ones that I came up with. But he came, you know, basically says, use no bulleted lists, no clip art, do not use handouts as slides, use stock images instead, maximum is six words per slide, so he's basically has a different approach, um, goes on, use handouts as separate documents, keep words to a minimum, so I'm not even going through his whole entire 10, but it's, as you can see that, you know, people came up with all these ways to start trying to um, help us figure out how to use PowerPoint differently, because our natural way of using it has just been abysmal. I think it goes back to Jenna's point of, what do you think of my death by PowerPoint? She thought of EDUCAUSE. Why? Because there were so many bad PowerPoint presentations or PowerPoint slide decks coupled with people who were just giving bad presentations. So I, I, as much as I love all of these kind of strategies, um, the 10, 20, 30 rule, etc., I, I, I think that they, they miss a point. Um, and that's that I think everything changes online. These rules about what to and what not to do are great, but in the 
but the environment and the tools and the way we present change when we're teaching online. And therefore, I argue, so should the way we use PowerPoint and present information. Specifically, often we think of presenting information online or with PowerPoint as in a lecture format. All right, so I have a question. And I'm going to have you respond in the chat pod, if you will. And so my question is, I have two questions, but we're going to start with one. I'm going to avoid using the poll, though I probably should use the polling feature. But we're, the first question is, and, you, and I just want you to say yes or no. And the question is, does PowerPoint equal lecture? Give a minute. Um, and probably by limiting you to yes or no isn't fair. So if you want to... Um, kind of um, couch that by all means jump in. But it's the so the question is, does PowerPoint equal lecture? I'll give a minute. It's it's kind of a um a setup question. You know, we, we when you ask that, we all say, well no, no it doesn't. A, a PowerPoint isn't equal to lecture. It isn't equal to teaching, but yet and, and and I would give it a defiant like no, it does not. Or it shouldn't. But yet when we faculty want to teach online, or specifically when they want to put their lectures online, um, I would argue that 90% of the time when faculty think about putting their lectures online, they think about putting their PowerPoints online. They think about putting the slide deck up there. And so while we can sit there when asked, oh, a PowerPoint doesn't equal a lecture, but in practice, it, it, all the time, at least in our department, I find, when faculty want to put their lectures online, they really just mean they want to put the PowerPoints. Um, so my next question is, um, does PowerPoint equal content? So this is a little different of a question, and it's one that probably you can't just answer yes or no. So I'm going to give you a minute to go off, and I realize I might lose you guys in the chat pod, but I'll give you a minute to respond to this question. Does PowerPoint equal content? And I specifically vague with this kind of idea of content. So I realize that, well, it depends what we mean by lecture. It depends what we mean by content. But, um, but if we think about you know, um, PowerPoint equaling content, I would say, well, it kind of depends. And I think that's kind of what's come up a little. Is as much as I hate PowerPoint presentations, especially bad ones, and I hate poor PowerPoint handouts, at least as a student, I always liked and still like to have the teacher's notes. And so if the only way I can get them is through a PowerPoint presentation, the only way I can get the content synthesized in their mind, in my faculty's mind, is through a PowerPoint, then as bad as it is, I always was um, content with having it. Um, content, content like that. Um, but depending on how depth or how much content typically each slide has, maybe they're useful, but maybe they're not. Um, and so when you think back, well, PowerPoint doesn't equal lecture, but yet we do think it equals content and we're uploading our slides. Well, how useful are they? And specifically, if faculty are actually following some of those rules we said before, the 10, 20, 30 rule, or the even Gar Reynolds, six words per slide, or even a or back to that video that we use just pictures. The other day, Dave and I were working on a um a paper that we um had done a slide deck for. Well, the slide deck was just images. And so I took it and I couldn't really generate anything from that because I couldn't remember exactly what we said. So you think back, well, gosh, if, if we're trying to move to having less text on our slides, well, how useful are those less text-heavy slides when we put them online? Now, of course, I don't think content or information necessarily equals teaching or learning. But I think it's something that we really need to think about. And so this brings me to what I call the online imperative. So I believe that faculty are faced with a PowerPoint online imperative when they teach online, or at least when they want to use PowerPoint in the typical way of presenting information or lecturing online in our online courses. So, you know, what is this online imperative, you ask? Well, it's the belief that I think that faculty need to do one of two things when using PowerPoint online. Now, the first is that they need to narrate their presentation. Now, um, narrating being that they need to record the lecture, um, whether audio or video, they need to actually sit there and have the kind of the content that supports these bulleted outlines. They need some narration. Or, if they don't want to narrate, if they don't want to record their PowerPoint, 
they need to add more content. Okay, so this is kind of contrary to what we think. Because adding more content might be as basic as adding more text. But yet we have this kind of idea that, well, you can't have too much text in a PowerPoint slide deck. And so now, faculty usually think of content as text. You know, in this picture I chose it because of books, and we think of books as where content lies. But really, you know, you can add more information-rich graphics, but not just graphics that kind of um, suggest something, but that explicitly states, state something. But you can also add audio, video. But the idea is that if you're not narrating your slides, or even if you are, you need to add more content. Why? Because students need they need what's missing there. They need a way to connect the bullets. There's a movie I saw. Um, I shouldn't even admit this. It was one I should blame my wife for. Some dancing movie a couple years ago, and there was a line in the movie that basically said that dancing is what happens between the steps. Now, I often like to think of education or learning what happens between the lessons, but I, I wondered if I could even make an argument that um, a presentation is what happens between the bullets. Now, of course, we want to argue let's not use bullets, of course, but this goes to the idea that faculty need to either add more content or narrate their presentations. Now, I'm going to go into different ways that you can do this, but what this kind of implies in a lot of ways is that that same slide deck that you use for your face-to-face -face classes, you shouldn't use for your online classes as is. Therefore, it's not good enough, in my opinion, to just upload your PowerPoint slides to your online course shop. You have to add more content, whether it's in notes or, or narrate or do something else to it. And so this might mean if you teach classroom based and online that you have two different slide decks, which I realize is not always what faculty want to hear. But that's something I think we need to think about, and that's kind of the idea behind this online imperative. So ways to narrate. There's kind of three different types of tools. There's so many tools out there. Um, and you can have a fancy little um, recording studio like this picture here. But really, you can just um, have what I have on my head, and that's a basic um, headset mic. And that's really all you need. But three ways that you can narrate your PowerPoint slides are, one, you can use PowerPoint. PowerPoint with a basic microphone. You could probably even use an internal mic on a laptop, though. My recommendation would be to have some type of external mic. You can re record on each of your slides. Now, there's some definitely drawbacks to this. PowerPoint, um, it basically creates these huge sound files, and then you have to zip them all in a folder, and it becomes a drag. But PowerPoint is an option, and it's something that a lot of times faculty don't jump in and, and experiment, but, but I really encourage it. The second thing is there's a lot of these PowerPoint add-ons. Um, Adobe Presenter is one, iSpring is another, um, Articulate is a very expensive one out there, um, and Empatica is another one. Um, and so these are all really great, and these basically the way they work is that in PowerPoint you have a tab where you can hit record, and basically it allows you to go through your slide deck and record them, and often export these as flash movies or other things, and so um, they're great options. The third one is um, to use a third-party app. So you can use Adobe Connect like I'm doing now and record your lectures. You can use Jing. You can use um, Photo Story or Movie Maker or iMovie. Now these last three are ones that people don't really think of, but basically PowerPoint slide deck you can save as individual images, and those images you can just import right into something like Photo Story or Movie Maker or iMovie, and then you can record according to that. So these are some of the things that I've used. Um, and I'll kind of wrap up at the end which ones I would use um, given certain situations. But what I want to do is I want us to kind of go together and talk about different um, tools that you might use, because I already see this happening in the chat pod. So we'll see if this works the way I think it should, um, is I want everyone to go to this URL, and I want us to start editing this document. So let's see if I can get this in the chat pod, see how well this works. I always like to test out ideas in the middle of a thing rather than um, trying it. Um, so I haven't really tested this, but let's pull up. All right. So, so what I want to do, and at least this is my vision, we'll see if it works, is I wanted us to jump in here because I already see it right now. Is there's so many tools out here, and, and honestly, there's probably even, in my experience, there's even more tools for some reason for PC users, perhaps because PowerPoint's um, it's just a bigger market, but um, I've, I've listed some ideas that I have of tools up here, and um, and 
John's mentioning time limit switching. This is stuff I want to capture with this Google Doc. So I'm hoping you can see it. I'm going to click edit this page if I have permission. I, I believe everyone has permission. I, I put it so anyone can edit it. I'm hoping that worked the way I thought. But um, so Jing, and this is something I can even just do myself. So a drawback of Jing is that it has a five minute limit. Now a positive of Jing is it's cross platform. It is um, free, at least if you do the basic. Um, I believe that the URL, and someone can correct me, is jingproject.com. Um, other tools, so PowerPoint, I think some of the drawbacks of PowerPoint, and feel free to jump in here and edit this if you guys want, um, is large file size. You basically have no export options, and what I mean by that is it doesn't give you the ability to export as a flash movie or something like that. Um, Keynote has some nice. options because I believe Keynote you can save as save as um, I think a QuickTime and um, maybe even Flash I think um, so John says he can't contribute to the spreadsheet so I'm wondering I'm going to open my email real quick because I, I was curious whether and I hadn't tried this before whether you had to have a Google Doc account to be able to jump in here um, my hope was that it would just allow you to anyone jump in but I'll see if I'm getting any requests. Um, we'll wait a second, but all right. So I'm going to go back to that Google Doc, and I will. All right. Well, I'm going to jump back to this, and hopefully, um, if my I was able to jump in. So someone Tracy was. So hopefully. You could add screen flow. So he said, oops, I'm getting reminded. So screen flow. Um, now a couple of these slide boom, um, slide share, and slide rocket, they do a lot of the same things. Um, slide share, I'll talk about at the end, is a great way where it's um, easy to upload and share text based PowerPoints. You can actually do what they call slide cast and upload audio with it, but I, I think it's a little clunky myself. Um, so that one is one I use for my slides. In fact, um, I'll talk later, but that's where you can get a copy of this. Articulate is an option out there, and Articulate is actually something where companies are using PowerPoint to create e-learning. And so they're using Articulate um, to basically do, um, I don't want to say complex, but some very basic but effective um, standalone online training. Um, I think the biggest con for Articulate is price. It's about um, $800. And Patica is also a little pricey. Um, iSpring is an add on. I like that it's um, free option, allows flash export. So if you go back to this idea of adding more text, well, you can then export as a flash file. And that sometimes gets rid of some of the issues you have with people, um, different platforms and different people who don't have the software. PowerPoint producers and add-on for PC users. The biggest, um, it's PC only. It's not really supported, so that's a drawback to that. Connect Pro, um, a drawback is you need access. So if you don't work at an institution where you have free access, it's a problem. I also think it... Um, doesn't allow embed of videos. Um, there's workarounds you can do, but I think that's a drawback. Um, Jing, Jing is one of my favorites. If you can keep it to five minutes, I think Jing is fantastic. Um, and uh, you know the problem is five minutes is short, and so I probably try to keep my little online um, lectures, if and when I do them, which isn't often, to less than ten minutes. Um, Camtasia, um, a drawback to that is it's you know I think it's about three hundred dollars. Um, iMovie Movie Maker, these are, um, I think the pros of these are that you already have them on your computer. So if you just basically save your slide deck as JPEGs, you can import them in and record to it and export as um, a number of different video options. So I really think that's a great option. Photo Story I like a lot, um, but it's um, PC only. Um, so some people added 
Prezi, uh, ScreenFlow, Animoto. Um, so I'm going to get going in a minute, but I really want, I would love for you guys to help me complete this document um, because then when I can post it online and other people can use it. Um, but the idea is that there's so many different options out there. And so in ways, um, and some of the feedback I've gotten before is, given all these options, what's a faculty to do? I mean, there's so many different options to narrate. And so my recommendation often for faculty is if you're brand new with this, um, Adobe Connect, get an account with Brian, and that's the best way to start um, recording your lectures, if that's narrating your lectures, that is. Um, you know, if you're working at the AMC campus, you might have Panopto, which is a way that does um, lecture capturing if you're teaching face-to-face. -face. Um, and so John asked the question, I'm getting distracted, but um, uploading slides to eCollege with audio, definitely. And so um, that's why, John, you know, my recommendation would be, and I'll show you some other options, but um, if you're going to do a lot of that outside Adobe Connect, Adobe Presenter, and I'll see if I can pull it up real quick. Um, Adobe Presenter, it's, it's $500, so that's the big drawback with Presenter. But Presenter, when I'm in PowerPoint and I click on my Presenter tab, I can record. So if I click record, it's going to, um, it says OK. It brings me to a thing like this where I can record each slide. Testing, testing, one, two, three. I don't know if it will work right now competing with my. And then I go to the next slide, I do it again. But the big thing is once I'm done, I can publish this and I can export it to as a flash file um, and then I can upload that to eCollege or Blackboard so that's one of my options. You can also upload it to Connect Pro so there's a lot of options with Presenter so if you have uh, departmental support for $500 I, I, I think Adobe Presenter is great. Um, I also haven't played with this but I love this insert Swift option because to me what it tells me I can do is I can download YouTube videos I can convert them to a Swift file and embed them in this um, and then export it as um, a self-contained um, flash file or um, other options. So I think that tools like that are great. But really, if I had to say the two options, if you were going to start off um, using and trying to narrate your PowerPoint, I would um, really, John, that's a great question. I don't believe Presenter is um, cross platform. And so, um, but honestly, the price alone to me, if it worked it and paid for it, I wouldn't touch it. Um, I really like free things. And so, um, to me, I would really encourage faculty to think about um, to think about either using Jing. It's five minutes, but as long as you chunk it up in five minutes, you can upload it as flash files. You won't have any problem with um, users in Blackboard or eCollege using it. And, or I would use Adobe Connect Pro. And so those are kind of my two main recommendations. So you give them this long list, and hopefully you guys are still working on this list. Um, you know, the question is, well, which do you use? I recommend Jing. You can keep it to five minutes, which is always a good strategy. Just take sometimes practice. Another drawback to Jing is you can't edit it. If you pay the $15 for the um, Pro account, you can download it as an MP4 file. And if you're comfortable editing in like iMovie or a Movie Maker or something like that, you can edit it. But really, to me, Jing is if you just don't want something easy. Because the thing is, once you record in five minutes, if you get something wrong, just do it over again. It's easy enough, and, and you know how to do that. Whereas editing video adds on layers of complexity. And so um, really my two recommendations are use Jing, keep it to five minutes, especially if you want, if you're using multiple course management systems um, and you want to be able to put your video in and out, or use Adobe Connect Pro. It's hosted for you, it's backed up for you, it's free, it's available. Um, and so I, those are kind of my two recommendations if you're going to narrate. Another way to go is to just add more content. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we also think um, that adding more content is basically just adding text. That's probably the one-on-one -on -one level. That's the easiest way. If you want to add more content to your slide, just add more text. Um, but other ways are adding graphics and other things as well. The second option, and this is sometimes the most appealing, is just add notes to your PowerPoint slides. So let's take a look at each of these. Um, and so hopefully we'll have some time in the end so we can revisit some of these ideas because like Joni's promoting voice thread, John's mentioned GarageBand's great for editing, and so um, these are all great options out there. So while I did kind of my two recommendations, by all means, I want to hear what you guys have to say. So this is an example of an adding more text slide. Now, it, the idea basically is, and this goes back to tools like Articulate, 
that allow you to basically take something like this and create it into um, a full-on self-paced online course. But as a multimedia platform, PowerPoint can be just like a web page. And because I'm viewing this sometimes 12, 18 inches away, some of the rules about 30 point font or bigger, they don't apply. Now, I wouldn't recommend using a six point font or something silly, but here I can just basically have good headings and I can explain what I want to say. And so by adding more content, text like this or content, I can basically create little individual um, lessons. And, and it's still probably a good idea, five, 10 minutes to kind of chunk them to. But, you know, whether it's something like maybe I want to teach students the basics on how APA citation works. Well, I can create a PowerPoint where I can have in-depth things. I can still have some bullets, but by adding more text like this, all of a sudden, what's missing, it's not that they get a lot more out of this. Now, it's, I still, I'm, I'm not saying you want to just bombard your students every week with, you know, things like this, because the argument becomes, if you're just going to text, why not put in Microsoft Word and give them your notes? Um, and, and that's by all means another strategy. Um, but the idea more is thinking that some of the rules that we um, are promoting for PowerPoint, best PowerPoint use don't apply with online because sometimes more text is better. Now, the other way to go, if you um, definitely don't want to take this approach, is to, wow, this is kind of a blurry slide, um, is to just use the notes feature in PowerPoint. And so, and, and this really goes back to faculty who you use the same slide deck for classroom and online. Well, then maybe you do have your basic, you know, 10, 20, 30 PowerPoint or 6 by 6 or whatever strategy you're using, but you add the text, the narrative down below in the notes section. Then you can um, print it as a PDF with the notes section. So it's basically one slide per. Because the problem with um, the previous option of adding a lot of text. Um, per slide, well that's assuming they're going to view it online and they're not printing it. If you want to have them print it and you want to give them this option, this is really the way to go because this is going to print each slide on an 8 by uh, 11 page. I can have all the content there and they can see it. And so specifically, um, if you're teaching both environments, this might be the way to go. The other benefit of this is by writing out your narrative, it encourages, if not dictates, that you practice and think through what you're going to say. Where so often we find that we just kind of wing it. We show up, we just kind of go with it. Um, and so this is, by all means, kind of a low-tech solution of this kind of online imperative of adding more text content. Now, um, something I want to, I want to actually go back to a point that I missed, um, is when you think about narrating, one of the things you, I think you should think about is um, accessibility. And so if you're going to narrate a PowerPoint presentation, it's still always great to have your um, lecture written out in a Word document so you have a transcript. So students who, um, if they have any kind of um, visual um, problems, they can, um, or auditory problems, whatever the case might be, whether it's they don't like reading on screen too long, by having um, a text transcript is always the way to go. And this kind of goes back to, um, I want to show this again. I don't know if it gives the option. But one of the options when you publish and presenter is they can actually produce the transcript for you. And so I haven't tried to go through this and do this much. But the idea to really do that to me sounds great. So all this little text I have below in my, um, in my notes section, it, if it works the way I think it's supposed to, it's supposed to transcribe that. And so I think that that's a great option that some of these high-end tools will give you. Okay. Um, all right, so additional things to consider. Let me get caught up. So I believe that faculty who are faced with PowerPoint, the PowerPoint online imperative, um, they need to start thinking about not just how do I, I mean, while the online imperative, I think, is an important point, of you have to add more content. So whether you narrate or add more text, do that. But there's other ways to kind of think about, well, how do I use PowerPoint differently online? And so. Um, I'm not going to get into all the different ways, but I, and, and I'm not even going to get into showing you how. To, but the idea is PowerPoint, you can add interactivity. So this goes back to this ha having um, something where I add more text to it. I can actually export this. Um, I can add transitions where I can link from slide to slide. And I can go basically just like a web page. And so you think about, well, how you can create these little mini learning objects, if you will in PowerPoint that you exported to Flash so students could have many little lessons. And so it's a different feeling than a typical just going through a PowerPoint slide deck. 
Now it does inc it basically assumes they're doing this online, but thinking about ways that you can kind of add interactivity. You know, you can have cl mouse clicks where they click on something and they get pop-up box. And so, so there are a lot of different kind of ways that you could do that. And so these are all kind of ways that you might do this. Um, you can use the same kind of idea to do basically quizzes. Um, you notice that font change in this? I did. Um, you could do this to create like quizzes online and um, other ideas. So what I want to do is I want you to kind of jump in the chat box right now and kind of share with me what are some other ideas. I mean, how do you use kind of PowerPoint differently? I talked about um, narrating it and kind of adding more content, but that's really about just replicating a lecture online, or maybe not replicating, but lecturing online. But what are other ways that um, you can use PowerPoint differently? So, um, John, you asked, how do I add these pop-up boxes? Basically, it's just their animations and drawings. So you draw text. You create text, you create a text box, you link it, and so when you click on one, the animation is the other pops up. Um, now, that's more to kind of get you the idea behind it, but it's thinking through, if you go back to this idea, if I have more text on the screen, I can have, just like with the website, a little thing, you know, FAQ, and they cl soon click on it, pops up a new box that kind of addresses this. I mean, thinking through, how do we, you know, PowerPoint's a multimedia platform. And companies are using things like Articulate and Captivate and other things to create flash-based quizzes and all kinds of things. But what are other ways we can use PowerPoint? I mean, has anyone used PowerPoint for games online? I think Jim has done something like this. I think Joni's done something like this. I know Joni's used, um, had students create presentations, different ones, rather than a lecture. I think she's done, had students do rock video, music videos. Um, Pachakach online, so that's a, that's another way. Um, uh, I'm gonna wait another minute, and we're gonna move on. But um, kind of see where we are with time. Comic book, so PowerPoint for that. I mean, the thing is, PowerPoint is it's just so robust, and so um, I, I I really want you to kind of encourage yourself to think about. Or what are ways that you could do things differently? In an interactive quiz, that's great. So digital storytelling is something that um, I've done. I've created digital stories in PowerPoint. I think it's great for that. Pachakacha is while it's a, um, a certain format of you know 20 second, 20 slides, 20 seconds, etc. You can then record that and export that out as a flash file. So for instance, I'll. I think we have time for me to show this real quick. So I created a, a Pachakacha the other day I did for the first time. It was kind of um, nerve-wracking. But I could sit here and take this and let's see if I have this. So I'm going to fire up Jing just to show you for those who haven't used Jing. But it sounds like we have a lot of pros here. So a lot of times I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. But I'm going to hit capture video. And all right. So. I've been thinking a lot about literacy lately. And so when I thought about what to do with Pachakachan, I thought about a lot of different things. Problems with PowerPoint, digital storytelling, online learning, these are all things I write about a lot. But for some reason I kept coming back to literacy. I'm not sure why this was. I'm not a literacy person. Or at least growing up I never thought of myself as one. These are pictures of my daughter Jordan. I don't think she considers herself a literacy person either. My wife and I find ourselves regularly fighting Oh wait, or is it advocating? No, no, it's fighting with her school district about the literacy instruction she gets. She was on an ILP for a while, but because her reading test scores increased, despite her below proficient writing scores, she was taken off of the literacy plan and the support she gets. So you ask why? Well, because in our district, literacy equals reading. What does literacy mean to you? I'm going to stop this, but I'd hit stop. And so and then in my case, I can simply um, upload this to, I can preview if I want, so I can see how it worked. And I'm going to um, just go ahead and upload this to Screencast. But this goes back to this idea of thinking about ways to use PowerPoint differently. Pichakacha is a different type of presentation. It's not what we think of as our um, traditional way of, let me get out of this stuff. Um, 
it's not what we think of as our traditional way of lecturing. And so I think of it as differently than just narrating a PowerPoint, but I, 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 it's that simple to basically create something different in PowerPoint, something that um, I don't know if I'm convinced it's as magical as um, seeing it in person, but it's still powerful. So Jing just gave me the URL. Hopefully that works. I just shared it. But you really kind of go back to thinking about how it shouldn't take that much more time to do something different, something great in PowerPoint. One of the tools I mentioned before, and I'm going to show you, is this thing called iSpring. And iSpring has a free version. And so with iSpring, I can quickly publish this as a flash file. And so let me just show you. And this kind of goes back to um, John's question of, you know, what happens when you have problems with I have 80 million things going on right now on my computer. Um, work with me. All right. So basically, you know, what his question was, well, how do I make sure PowerPoint's narrated show up right? Well, the tools like this, iSpring, created basically a flash file that I can then upload into my PowerPoint. And then whether someone's on Firefox, Mac, PC, they can all see it. And so the same type of thing can be done in um, Adobe Presenter. I mean, they all give you some of these basic things. Even Adobe Connect. This is a PowerPoint that I put up online. And it basically creates a flash version that I can link to that regardless of someone's browser, but you can see, let's go back to that. That was an embedded YouTube video that doesn't work. But the point being is that there are a lot of ways that you can distribute. And so we got to think about well, how do we distribute um, our PowerPoint slides, our lecture, our Pachaksha, whatever it is. And so some of the ones I've used before are like SlideShare, Script, um, Google Docs even, especially if you're just adding more text. Um, but it, back to kind of Jing and why I think Jing's great is with a basic account with stream, Screencast, I can upload it as I just did, and you can jump in there and see it. And so it's flash based. So the one last thing I'll show you, and then we'll kind of leave it open for any Q&A. We're getting near the end of time, is SlideShare. I want to promote that um, because SlideShare is a place where I can upload my slide deck. And so I can take a look at, um, let me. I forget that on the two screens I'm in the wrong place. Um, but I can look at the slides that I've uploaded. I can um, see the slides. I can see how many views. So if I go down to something like this presentation I did here, 3,000 people have seen this presentation. And so that's something that by uploading this, I'm able to distribute it in a way that I couldn't before. But what I like especially is if I click on like this slide deck, students can not only um, download it and share it with other people, but I can get embed code over here and I can embed this into my online course. And so this goes back to kind of John's question, specifically if I'm not using audio though, it does give you an audio option. Um, if I'm just adding stuff with more text, this box right here can appear in my online course and I have a lot more control about it visually. Also I can ensure that students have access to it to more. They can still download it, they can share it with others. So I want you to really think about when you're using PowerPoint differently online, thinking about, well, what are ways that you would distribute it? How can you not only put it in your course, but how can you share it with other people differently than just sending a PPT file? All right. So with that, that's kind of the gist of what I was going to rant about today. Um, my contact information is up there. I'm going to be available in the chat pod. I'm going to um, stop the recording in a few minutes. But if you want me to kind of elaborate on any of the kind of ideas I talked about, I will. If you want me to talk about any more of the tools, that I mentioned, I will. Um, the biggest thing is I just want to encourage faculty to, um, to first and foremost, narrate your PowerPoint presentations and or add more text. Um, but also, and, and kind of implied with that, is practice your presentations that you put online. Um, but also think about ways that you can kind of break out of that lecture um, kind of um, restriction and think about what are other ways that I can use PowerPoint online, whether it's through creating simulations where you have a picture of um, someone and they click on it and they get a voice where, um, I mean, there's so many really kind of unique um, and arguably higher end ways that you can use um, PowerPoint. But with anything, think about how are ways that you can change up the pace because I don't care how great the lecture is, I don't care how great the little simulation is, if you do the same thing every week for 15 weeks, your students are going to hate it. Um, in my experience, um, even ice cream every you know or pizza that's an example. One time I had pizza for like a week. Um, long story, but yeah, I love pizza, but I got so sick of pizza by the end of that week. 
Um, so that's gist of it. Um, so I'm just going to shut up. I'm going to get in the chat pod and we'll go from there. Um, I think we have officially 10 more minutes, five more minutes maybe. Um, let's see, I'm not even sure. Um, and then I know um, we're ending, but I'm around. So thanks, guys. I think that's a, that's a great idea, and that's something I didn't even talk much on, or what are ways, I mean, kind of implied with this, or what are ways that students can use um, PowerPoint differently, and, and so you, what you're talking about is kind of collaboratively having them create PowerPoint decks together, um, and I think that PowerPoint or Google Docs, their presentation tool is a great way to do that. You can track to see what everyone contributed, but I think that also when we think about presentations online, um, thinking about ways that we can have students, whether it's synchronously in Adobe Connect or having them record them themselves. Um, Joni has some great examples of some stuff her students have done um, of different ways of using PowerPoint. So I think from a student side, yeah, there, there's there's a lot of great um, ways that you can do that. So, it, so John, can you elaborate on what didn't work well with the Google Doc? Was it um, that students didn't have um, accounts or I know with at least like even the Word version of Google Doc you can only have a, a certain amount of contributors so was it that? Um, I'm interested in knowing more how that didn't uh, go. So you'd like to see examples. We'll see if Joni can share some. I don't know um, if she's able to but I'm going to even show I'm going to pull up um, and this was something I probably should have done earlier as I've been as I've been ranting about PowerPoint for some time I collect a lot of resources on PowerPoint, um, and so I'm going to share my delicious links on PowerPoint. All right, Joni's sharing one right there. Great, because it's really amazing what um, students can do. Now it's it's good to always give them examples and models so they. Um, Joni, I think putting in the U right there is great. Um, you can have control too if you need it. I can give you control. There's um, a list of kind of my delicious PowerPoint um, things. There's 66 up there, but I want to show you an example of um, oh, I can't find it, but J This was one, and, and I assume I can share this, Joni, because this was something you sent me. Um, so, but this is some stuff that Westwood um, gave, and so if for some reason I can't share any of the Westwood stuff, Joni, tell me right now and I won't post it. But um, they used, um, in this example, they put this up in, I believe it's Adobe Connect, um, and this is an example where they just use basic slides and used like a role-playing simulation, and so I'm going to post this here, Joni, this is your last second to tell me. No, no, no. All right, yeah, it was part of that. So she's saying yes. So that's an example. I want to try to get another one um, because I've been really trying to collect some of these examples because I think they're great ways of thinking about how you use PowerPoint as um, something different. Um, all right, where, where? go back. I think Joni's sharing all kinds of stuff so you guys um, because Joni's been thinking about this for a while and she's you know obviously been very influential my thinking about it but it's this kind of how do we use um, PowerPoint differently or how do we present differently does it have to be even I mean as even though I'm arguing that you should narrate your presentations I mean a, a boring PowerPoint is a boring PowerPoint so you can narrate all you want and it's still not necessarily going to mean that it's any good. Um, and so this is an interactive timeline, which could be done in PowerPoint. Um, I think Joe and I are probably overwhelming everyone with resources. I'm going to actually um, try to make this bigger. So. If Um, and, and what I should probably do is put these all in a document and share it, but I'm trying to look for something else real quick.
I think there's only a few of us now. Like it's showing Brian still here, but I think it's just Jill, John, and Joni and I. So um, by all means, if you guys have to go, don't feel like you need to um, stick around and chat. But you know, I, I just want to make sure all questions are answered. And so what I'm gonna do? I'm still trying to find one more resource. So John, hopefully, you know, some of these ideas were helpful. Hopefully for those of you who are still here, this was helpful. Um lecture example. And I think this is an example. This is an example I think that Westwood did in Adobe Presenter. So um All right, I think we've kind of gone overkill, so um, it's 12 o'clock. So I'm going to stop recording this, but I'm going to try to capture all of these your links and um, send this out so everyone has this. Um, but I appreciate, guys. I'm still going to be around. I'm just stopping recording. Thanks.